Hello once again, fellow Sojourners. Thanks for tuning in for part two of our Risqué series, in which we analyze how we define what is and isn't Risqué, and tiptoe our way through the cultural minefields of fashion, nudity, and art in pornographic relativism. Parental warning, some of the content in this episode may not be suitable for children of all ages, and I'm talking about the Bible passages. So plug their ears, close their eyes, or send the little urchins outside, and if at any point in the duration of this video it becomes too Risqué, head to your nearest exit. In some cases, your nearest exit might be behind you. I'm Pastor Pastor Shane, I'll be your body shamer today as we appropriate some culture. So last week we outlined that we as Christians are biblically called to dress modestly with decency and propriety. But what is and isn't modest is cultural. It's determined by the culture. Different cultures have different modesty standards. It varies from place to place and it changes over time. So our response to one another should be very grace-filled. But a good principle would be that Christians shouldn't push the boundaries of dress. Our fashion should be very comfortably modest within our cultural standards. Now, I think many Christian women make certain fashion choices in order to mitigate the lust of men. And that's understandable because every single psychological and sociological study on the topic indicates that men are much more visually stimulated than women. We tend to have a bigger problem with lust prompted by visuals. One of the funniest things I ever saw in church was there was a young woman who, who walked down the aisle past the, the back row of pews where there was a bunch of young men. And as she walked past, I saw each of the young men do this. And the guys noticed that each of them did that and they all started laughing. Now, what caused that? Was he dressing immodestly? No, I, I didn't think so. Uh, but you can look at that and say, well, she should have dressed down more. And good-hearted Christian women will point to scriptures like Romans. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So in that passage, Paul is saying just because it's not wrong doesn't mean you should do it. It's not sinful to eat meat or drink wine, but if it causes your brother to sin, don't do it. And he says something very similar in Corinthians. So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. And so people take that principle and apply it to dress. It's not wrong to dress in a way that is culturally normal and appropriate, but if it causes my brother to stumble, that's wrong. I think that's noble, and as Christians, we ought to care for one another and examine how the way we live our lives affects others. But in this context, I just don't know if it makes much of a difference. Yeah, I remember a clip from the Johnny Carson Tonight Show in which Johnny was talking with a 97-year-old man, and they started talking about the changes in fashion over the years. Check this out. Now, you've seen a lot of changes, especially in women. I mean, women are treated completely differently today than they were when you were growing up. Oh, I mean, land, yes. equal rights uh, and that mm -hmm. and all that. Yes. <laughs> well, what's been the biggest change, do you think? The independence of women or? No, gosh almighty, when I was a kid, I was tickled to see a girl's ankle. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty rare. Really? Yeah. We'd stand around town there, maybe a muddy day, ladies have to come along, Raise up the skirt a little. We'd see their ankle. <laughs> well, what would that do when you'd see Oh, it? do? <laughs> yeah. Every day. You'd prepare you for the next deal. <laughs> prepare you for the next deal. Yeah. So a woman's ankle was exciting. He bet it was. If men can lust after ankles, they can lust after anything. And there's no manner of dress that we can revert to that will shield us from lust because once again, sin is not external. The problem of lust is not what someone's wearing, it's what's in someone's heart. And we know this because lust has been a problem throughout all of human history and throughout all the various fashion trends. Now I suppose you could slap on a burqa or dress so counterculturally that you eliminate the problem. But that's sort of the fashion equivalent of being Amish. You're not in the world anymore. And maybe they're not going to lust after you, but they're also not going to date you or marry you or invite you to parties because you're a freaking weirdo. 
In Banarav is a perpetual tension. We don't want people to stumble, but we also don't want to hinder the gospel. And do you really think in our culture people would be receptive to a religion where the women had to dress like this? I doubt it. See, there's no clear-cut answers with cultural issues. I think women should be mindful of what kind of effect they're having on men. And more importantly, I think that they should be mindful of why they're dressing the way they're dressing. But a culturally appropriate, modest, and decent wardrobe can't be held liable for the sins of others. And if you're dressing in the style of the age, even the most modest and chaste woman is going to turn some heads sometimes. But is that lust? Were those boys lusting? Well, it's kind of ogling, but at some point we have to acknowledge that God made man to be physically and visually attracted to woman. The survival of our species kind of depends on it. And it can't be confined to marriage because our attraction to our spouses predates our marriage. Unless we're going back to arranged marriages, physical attraction is part of how we choose our spouses. So are we all sinning in that? I don't think so. I think there is, or at least can be, a difference between admiring beauty and lusting. Sometimes that's a thin line, but it is a line, which I think we see better when it comes to art. The human body and human form is a thing of beauty. Men find the female form to be beautiful. Women find the male form to be tolerable. But that form becomes more tolerable if it has a good job, nice car, or big bank account. But the point is, the human form is a thing to be admired, and many of our greatest works showcase it, even the naughty parts. The Venus de Milo, or the birth of Venus, Venus is always half nude, Michelangelo's David, Rembrandt's Bathsheba at her bath, even the Sistine Chapel's got nudity. Is that wrong? Some of these works are by Christians, and some of them were commissioned by the church. But even though there's rampant nudity, we understand when it comes to art that these are not objects of lust, but things to be admired. Its purpose is to elevate the human soul, not debase it. And that doesn't mean that it's asexual or completely anodyne. Venus is the goddess of love, and so her persona is meant to be sexual in some way. Just like the least quoted book of the Bible, the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, is meant to be sexual. Sexuality is a creation of God. It's a part of humanity, and there's goodness and beauty in that that ought to be celebrated. There's a difference, there's a line, between admiration, celebration, and lustful licentiousness. But where that line is, is more difficult to define than you might think. You could say, well, uh, those are just paintings and sculptures. They're not real people. And that's why it's art and not porn. No. You know, I grew up in Japan. Some of the most degenerate, debasing material out there is anime, just drawings. In fact, that's probably the most popular form of pornography in Japan. So the medium is not why. And I think you could point to still photos or even films that contain nudity. Schindler's List comes to mind, which is about Nazi concentration camps. There's quite a bit of nudity. They're real people, they're really nude, and they're really on film. Is that wrong? Is it pornographic? Or is it something else? It's harder to define than you think. That's why you have a famous line by Justice Potter Stewart in a 1964 Supreme Court case that was dealing with obscenity charges. He said, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description, hardcore pornography, and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so. But I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that. And I think that's generally true. We know it when we see it. We intuit it, especially when we understand the intention behind it. The nudity in Schindler's List is not intended to titillate or to invoke lust. It's intended to invoke sympathy. It's an expression of the dehumanization that the Jewish people suffered under the Nazis. So it's not so simple to say, does it show this or not show this? Intention matters. But the standard of, I know it when I see it, it's not much of a standard because of the subjective quality of the I in that sentence. Here's a different standard from a fellow Christian. Hi, everyone. I wanted to see if there was a better alternative to pure flicks that is actually Christian because they're not as clean as we would like. We have come across scenes of girls dressed in modest or attitudes of kids in the kids section. I also want to clarify that I would like something that is strictly Christian, that is not Catholic. Not meaning to be offending, just my preference. Well, that's fitting because the sponsor of Appropriate in the Culture today is Pure Flix. When Pure Flix isn't pure enough, turn to Pure Flix. Pure Flix works with all of your streaming devices and can take even the most offensive, repugnant material, like my R rated film Surviving Confession, and make it actually Christian. Now you can enjoy 90 minutes of good, clean, family blank screen with occasional music. Treat yourself and your family to an unending library of establishing shots, 
aerial footage, and the random insert or extreme close-up. Purer flicks, why do you own a television? Alrighty, so I gave that person a bit of a hard time, but that's really not too different from the way that a lot of Christians think about these things, where everything has to be squeaky clean, regardless of even intent. And that just makes me think, have you read your Bible? I mean, the Bible is not clean. It has depictions of rape and incest and prostitution and vulgarity. Here's some scripture. When she carried on her prostitution openly and exposed her naked body, I turned away from her in disgust, just as I had turned away from her sister. Yet she became more and more promiscuous as she recalled the days of her youth when she was a prostitute in Egypt. There she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emission was like that of horses. So you long for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your young breasts fondled. That's pretty graphic. That's pretty vulgar. You're not likely to see those verses plastered on things at Hobby Lobby. But what is the intent? What's the meaning behind it? Andrew Claven is a novelist, podcaster, and screenwriter. He came to Christ kind of late in his life, and he was on the uh, Babylon Bee podcast talking through some of these issues, which I thought was interesting. Take a look. I think that that has made Christian art, which was once the art, um, you know, when you think about Dostoevsky, when you think about the Sistine Chapel with its horrors and its beauties and all that, when you think about Bach, I mean, mm -hmm. it was once the great art form, the greatest art form, uh, the greatest inspiration of art. Uh, it has made Christian art just banal um, and and not realistic. And God is the God of the real world. And so it is actual it is actually your job as an artist to depict the real world. And it can you know, I'll, I'll tell you, this is. Uh, a good true story, a good example, was I, I wrote this uh, trilogy, Another Kingdom, which we put out as a podcast uh, at the Daily Wire, and it was very popular, and it, it was not a Christian story, it was a fantasy story, not a Christian story, but obviously had deep Christian underpinnings. And in, in the first, as I was writing the first volume, um, I, I started to think, oh, oh gee, Christians are really going to like this this story. You know, some fantasy with knights and slashing. But I thought this is it. So I'm going to just see if I can cut out all the cursing because I know that they hate that stuff. Hmm. So I tried and it was absurd. I mean, it just was absurd. It was about the whole thing was about uh, 20 somethings in L.A. To have them talk without cursing was to basically to lie. I couldn't do it, you know. <laughs> Golly gee, so Willikers, over, man. What you say this is a fantasy, though? Like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I overcompensated and I put in too many F words in the podcast. I cut them out when the book was published. I, I cut them back when the book was published. But then later on in the third volume, there's an actual sex scene. And it's not I wouldn't call it graphic, but it's spirited it's a sex scene. You know, it's a, it is a, a real sex scene. And can you, all can the you read Christians, it to us right now? Yeah, I, I'll act it out for you. <laughs> uh, the Christians got very upset about it. And what was interesting about it was the, the kind of. I, I won't say there was a point to the scene, but what was going on in the scene was the guy was doing something that was really immoral in having sex with this particular girl. And it was also blissful. He was having the greatest time of his life. And I was making the point that like, that's not actually a good guide to morality, whether you're having a good time or not, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And, it, and it, I was just showing you that the, that the life that he was obviously headed into, which was not a very good life, was a fun life as he mm -hmm. went down the drain. And a lot of Christians were like, well, that was unnecessary. And I thought if it was unnecessary, you know how you know it's necessary? I put it in. That's how you know it's necessary. I would not put something in any kind of scene into my book if it weren't necessary. And so I, I just think this kind of uptight, um, you know, don't show me anything. Don't, you know, uh, soil my eyes. Everything has to be good for children uh, really is, has ruined Christian art. Men can lust after ankles, but sin is not external. So what do you think? Is there a place or use for nudity or even sex scenes in Christian books or movies or art? Let me know what you think on the usual social media platforms, and I'll see you right back here next week for some other hot-button issues. In the meantime, go appropriate some culture.